many people have heard of the lymph system. Um, it's a system in our bodies that sort of parallels our blood vessels. And um, when fluid comes out of our blood vessels, it gets in between the cells. Um, and then in order to return back to the heart, it travels through the lymphatic uh, vessels um, and comes back into the circulation up in here in the neck. Uh, it, uh, it's very important in um, lipid metabolism in the body. We've known that for many, many, many years. Um, well, what's just being realized about the brain is that it has its own lymphatic system, and it's called the glymphatic system, beginning with a G. The reason that it's called the glymphatic system is that it's a combination of two words, uh, glia, G-L-I-A, and lymphatic. The glia are cells um, in the brain that are supportive to the neurons and help to provide nourishment, structure. Um, and it turns out that the glial cells in the brain actually form channels that carry fluid um, in the brain. They carry fluid into the brain cells they also carry fluid out of the brain cells and bring it back into the blood vessels um, to be um, distributed throughout the body, uh, back into the, the uh, circulation. And it has, is now being shown that the substances that are produced in the brain um, byproducts of brain metabolism, uh, products that can in their own way be injurious, uh, leave the brain through the glymphatic system. Uh, one of the products that's being looked at very closely is beta amyloid. People have um, may be aware of that because it's uh, involved with the development of Alzheimer's disease. And that substance can be delivered out of the brain, taken into the circulation, broken down in other parts of the body. But if the lymphatic system isn't working well, um, then uh, it, it can build up in the brain. Other toxic substances can build up in the brain. Um, one of the really interesting things that has been found um, about the lymphatic system is that when we go to sleep, um, the lymphatic system gets bigger um, and brings out uh, more fluid. It increases the fluid delivery rate by about 30 to 40 percent when we sleep. Um, there are some other things about that that are beginning to be understood is that position when we sleep um, has an effect on the size of the lymphatic system. So that sleeping on our stomach is not as good as sleeping on our back, and the best way to sleep is on our side. I have no idea why that's the case. I have seen in a number of very, very old texts, um, especially uh, yoga texts, that side sleeping is the uh, best way to sleep. Um, it, it is said in some yoga test, texts that it's best for men to sleep on their right side and best for women to sleep on their left side. Um, that hasn't been documented by Western science at this point, but as long as we're trying to optimize our sleep, we might as well do um, the things that are most beneficial. Um, 
I do know that <clears throat> um, sleeping on our back um, is um, uh, tends to cause more airway obstruction uh, and airway obstruction increases pressure in the brain, uh, increased pressure, pressure in the brain decreases uh, flow through the lymphatic system. So that stands to reason. Um, sleeping on our stomachs puts more pressure on our stomachs when we're sleeping. And one of the very interesting things that's been documented about the lymphatic system is that some of the fluid that is being transported out of the brain for detoxification goes into the blood vessels in the brain. But a proportion of the fluid travels out of the brain along what are called the cranial nerves. Um, there are 12 cranial nerves. Um, I won't go through all of them. Two of them that are really important um, are the olfactory nerve, which is involved with our sense of smell. The olfactory nerve comes into the area, um, the front of our brain, right above our nose. <clears throat> and the other nerve is the vagal nerve. The vagal is part of the parasympathetic calming nervous system. Vagal nerve has a lot of connections into the intestines. Um, and so if we're putting pressure on our abdomen when we're sleeping at night, um, that can affect fluid flow through the vagal nerve, uh, perhaps impeding it, um, decreasing the flow. Uh, what's now known about um, the flow of fluid through the olfactory nerve and the vagal nerve is that about 30 to 40 percent of the fluid that comes out of the brain comes through the olfactory nerve and the vagal nerve. So anything that we do to improve the health of the olfactory nerve and uh, the vagal nerve can secondarily improve the beneficial effects of our sleep. We've known for some time that there are intimate connections between our gut and our brain. Um, so, and here's another connection um, where fluid can actually flow back and forth from our brain to our gut along the vagal nerve and potentially can flow from our gut back up into our brain along the vagal nerve. One of the um, important um, functions of the, the uh, lymphatic system is on uh, cholesterol metabolism in our brain. Um, our brain uses a lot of cholesterol and in order for that balance to be maintained, um, we have to have the free ability of fluid to flow um, into nerve cells through the lymphatic system and out of nerve cells through the lymphatic system. So it's not a one-way street. It goes both ways. Um, anything that we can do to improve the flow through um, the lymphatic system is going to help our brains. And it is very clear that with sleep, um, there is an increased flow. There have also been studies done with sleep deprivation in experimental settings, and the flow drops below normal during those times. So um, the more and better sleep we have, the better brain health we're going to have. You know, I feel like there's a little bit different traditions and all that. I know I heard one, I went to a, like a class a long time ago, and they said, Oh, you're supposed to lie down on your um, right side, you know, after, at the end of class, right? All right. 
and I got thinking about that. And of course, the instructor had no, you can't ask this instructor anything because they don't have an understanding beyond that, <laughs> what they were told, you know. Uh, right. But I got thinking about it, and, you know, for our heart, you know, pumping out on the left, then that makes sense that if you lie on the right, it's less work to get up to get the blood recirculated. Uh -huh. Right. If I lie on my left, it's got to get all the way up to the right side, fighting gravity. You know that that little maybe this much more, right? Uh -huh. So that kind of makes sense to me. But I never, uh, Tom, I can't figure out the uh, males do this, females do that thing. Where I've seen this, and I'm not, is primarily in Tibetan practices, and what they describe. Um, are, is a system of channels that um, go in and connect with the chakra system and holes that fascinatingly go in through the nostrils, swing up by the base of the brain, and then go down on either side of the spinal column, and then swing, go down to the intestinal level, and then swing up back um, right in the area of the solar plexus. And um, in men, um, one tends to be more open, um, and in women, the opposite one. And what they recommend is in men lying on the right side, the left side tends to be closed off in men. And so they recommend that men sleep on the right side because it opens up the left a little bit more to balance out the flow. Uh, reverse in women. Um, but the interesting thing about, for me, is that they're sort of describing these places where the lymphatic system um, connects with their energy system through the nose, down into the intestines, and back up around the heart. It's just fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild. And the you know a lot of those breathing practices where you inhale you know deliberately through your nostrils, and um, this is a Tibetan one too. You know you follow these channels down the side, and you try to send that inhalation from your nose all the way up and in down to the yeah. abdomen. And it's a little bit different than just uh, straight belly breathing, right? Like, oh, focus on your belly, and what, it's really drawing the line. Yeah. <laughs> One size of breathing definitely does not fit all. <laughs> Have you seen the, uh, I read an article a while back about superbugs in hospitals and how the, the sinks where the nurses wash their hands and everything is really... Um, a bad place. Yeah. What they were finding was that the bacteria are getting washed off the hands of the nurses, but they are um, building lattices of biofilms in the plumbing and climbing back up through their own biofilms and basically launching themselves out of the sink. <laughs> and of course, they would have access to every room through the plumbing system. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you know, I hadn't heard that. Um, I had read another study where they, um, in opening new facilities, they went in and they uh, took cultures from throughout the hospital ahead of time, um, and sort of routine bacteria were there. And then after only a week of being open, they went in and did reculturing, and there were all these horrible pathogenic bacteria. And then they brought dogs in and had the dogs live there. And after about a week, the bacterial colonies went back to normal. I love Let's this. Go with the dog. Sleep with the dog. <laughs> I love this. You've seen they're they're making uh, probiotics for your your home now, right? No, I didn't see that. Yeah, there's a company they make it's a spray, and you spray it all over the place in your house to keep to keep it anti-sanitary, you know, to keep 
a healthy uh, bacterial right, balance. Right, right. It's supposed to be really uh, people love it. <laughs> but I think you could just get a dog, and their you know their their micro uh, cloud around them should do the job. Yeah, 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 exactly. Blame it on the dog. <laughs> So anyway, I think about these. I think about these bugs going uphill in the drains, and I think about the vagal nerve, and um, you know, I don't know how much room they have to navigate around, how tight the spaces are, and everything. But if fluid can move down it, I wouldn't be surprised if these these things can scale up it. Uh, are there um, herbal effects on the olfactory nerve? Um, what we often call quote seasonal allergies and they may be or food allergies and they're getting all stuffed up do the herbs that we're using have any primary effect on the nasal mucosa to keep it healthy in in chinese medicine they have these statements of fact and it's kind of what we base our physiology on and it all it it sounds strange when you're first learning these things and you have to kind of you know get with the almost circular logic until you've got a sense of context and, and, you know, the subtleties and all that. But there are statements about how the, the spleen or the digestive system is the source of phlegm and the lung is the receptacle. Okay. So, you know, we have, um, you know, kind of this concept of like turbid fluids, you know, pathological fluids and um, a lot of like what's going on with microguard is to help get that out. And, uh, you know, Aquata or Ermiao, you know, is to like, help to get this, the dampness out. Uh -huh. I found personally that when I keep a clean diet, I don't get allergies. If I eat, um, you know, too much sweet stuff, then I'm sneezing. Now I'm, I'm reactive to my environment, right? And now, you know, mm -hmm. subjectively, I've eaten these kind of, dampening foods that challenge my digestion and now i have like a wet nose uh -huh. got it and so there are um there are three primary herbs that in chinese medicine for sinus congestion and you know sinus infections and things like that and um, there's there's more than three but there are kind of like three big ones that you learn and one of them is in microguard ah uh, okay so the particular herb i'm thinking about is bijard Angelica de Hurricane Radix. And when most TCM doctors think of this herb, one of the first things we think of is uh, sinus clearing and frontal headache. And I'm wondering if there's more to this herb than just that aspect. It's a great question. So first of all, let's look a little deeper at the glymphatic system. It diminishes with age, partly because of the loss of something called AQP4 polarization. Currently, there is nothing in Western medicine to maintain or speed up glymphatic transport as a potential therapy for prevention of dementia and other neurological disorders. Currently, people are looking at the role of nitric oxide on AQP4 polarization and the importance of normal cilia function for the maintenance of the normal parenchymal CFS support. The general pathogenesis is that Inflammatory cytokines go up due to various causes of inflammation in the body. The blood to brain barrier shuts down. The glymph stops flushing. Sleep goes bad. The brain stews in toxicity, and that's where nerves start to die. With the neural decay, amyloid plaques, dementia, and mental illness follow. At the very least, people get grumpy and say, Get off my lawn! So we'll look at somebody with neural decay, even as a youngster or relative youngster, and this was over 2,000 years ago. There was a scholar named Nerdy McDork Pants, and he was overthinking and overstudying due to his government job, and over time, he became less efficient. He started to get mental fatigue, mental fog. He was in a state of burnout. This brain fog is very detrimental to people in modern times. So he was credited with discovering or rediscovering this particular herb. So we're looking at his story. This is a 
folklore kind of story. It's not historical, so I'm going to go ahead and take some license with it. But Mr. McDorkpants uh, had persistent headaches, and the local doctors weren't very helpful. The usual pain-killing herbs weren't effective in his case. So Nerdy McDorkpants heard of a headache specialist deep in the mountains called Mr. Quackerdoodle, the mountain wizard, self-identified as male. Mr. Quackerdoodle, the mountain wizard, used unconventional herbs and exclusively treated headaches from his mountain lair. Wait. You have a headache specialist who situated his cave clinic on top of a mountain? What kind of move is that? You're only going to get people who have already climbed a mountain to see you with their headache. So you mean to tell me that people have exercised, breathed fresh air, moved their blood, sweated a little bit, maybe had time to let their mind calm down and forget their worries, and they arrive at his door and then he performs a miracle? Yeah, it's really some very specific selection criteria because... Obviously, he's going to be, you know, selecting against people with brain tumors, right? No, that's, uh, that is a smooth move on his part. So Nerdy McDorkpants arrived at his hut. Mr. Quackerdoodle said he would treat the nerd on the condition that he didn't bother him with any fancy questions. Oh, this is great. Not only is this a time saver, it's also best to shroud your lack of medical training in vague and mystical language as though you're a 1970s American acupuncturist. The nerd agreed. Around an hour after taking his first dose of herbs, his headache went away. Instead of showing that he recovered, he pretended to still be in pain. You ever have patients who do this? Maybe they're collecting some kind of insurance money. This guy was just malingering in order to get some benefit. Times never change. He waited for the doctor to go into the hills and pick more herbs. While he was out, Mr. Nerdy snooped around and took samples and notes to identify the plant. When Mr. Quackerdoodle returned, he said, Well, you know the plant now, so at the very least understand how and when to use it. He explained that it was ideal for frontal headaches associated with colds. It wasn't for every type of headache. It was mainly used for headaches associated with the GI tract and what today we would consider the immune system. Mr. Quackerdoodle said it was without a name and asked Nerdy to name it and write the characters for him. Nerdy McDorkpants considered and named it Xiang Bai Zhi. Xiang means fragrant, Bai means white, and Zhi is the young root. The name was designed to be practical and help people identify it in the days before Latin binomial nomenclature. So as we look for connections between the digestive system, the immune system, mental health, and even sinus infections, we've been looking at neurology. And, you know, this herb shows a lot of promise, especially given once you understand channel theory and how the front of the head is typically correlated to the Yang Ming, which contains the stomach and the large intestine. So for anybody with an acupuncture slash herb background, there's a lot of boxes getting checked off here in terms of uh, this herb and its potential. Also, the association of frontal headaches being with the uh, stomach and large intestine is something that isn't limited only to Chinese medicine. There's a Western medical doctor who learned of this association in Chinese medicine. And when his patient came in with a very hot frontal headache for no apparent reason, he immediately looked at the guy's large intestine and was able to detect colon cancer very early on. So this is a nice diagnostic nugget of association that even five years ago, what was that association? You couldn't really tell. There was no direct link. However, as more research comes to light, we can sew up these medical traditions and find that an association people have found physiologically, even if the anatomical reasoning wasn't there may be useful at least to lead the questioning. So let's take a look a little bit at the pharmacology. There are over 50 coumarins and these are components in the herb which directly affect lymphatic drainage and it's useful for lymphedema. Traditionally this is used for sinus infections, 
reducing pus and swelling, discharging pus, and increasing the reduction of what's called dampness. It kills staph. It's antimicrobial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory, has a regulatory effect on nitric oxide. This is really important for lymphatic drainage, sleep, and the regulation of neurotransmitters. Elevated and suppressed nitric oxide are both associated with neural decay. Baija also reduces airway inflammation. It increases antigen drainage into the cerebrospinal fluid. It induces cytochrome C-dependent apoptosis in human promyelocytic leukemia. It also induces apoptosis in colon cancer cells. So no, I'm not saying it's a cure for leukemia or colon cancer, but it's pretty nifty all the same. It does demonstrate that it has regulatory influences on the immune system. The antigen drainage is particularly important because this is coming from the meningeal linings. When the meningeal lining gets too much inflammation, it's called meningitis and it can kill you pretty quickly. Via the glymphatic flush, Baija has effects on GABA transmenase. When GABA transmenase goes running crazy, you do too. Unchecked, GABA transmenase is associated with a number of neuropsychiatric disorders. So Baija, it's great, it's wonderful, but is it great for everybody? No. And in particular, it's not great if you happen to be on uh, medications such as tolbutamide, and this is a drug for non-insulin dependent diabetes. And the reason for this is because it appears to it appears to keep it in the body longer and slows the liver's breakdown of it. So generally you want to take it about two hours away from medications like this. This is also true with diazepam. Interestingly with diazepam, which is a sedative, it's used for alcohol withdrawal, for sleep disorders, it appears to bind to the diazepam and benzodiazepam. So it keeps it from leaving the bloodstream. However, it's binding to them and it's blocking their pathways in the cells so that they're less effective. So again, this isn't great. You don't want diazepam hanging out in your bloodstream, not getting to where it needs to be and not getting catabolized by the liver. So again, giving it a two, two hour window between drugs and herbs is generally a safe way to go. Baija is one of the most commonly used herbs in East Asia. It's used quite frequently with people who are also on these drugs, but the two-hour window needs to be respected. So from a pharmacological point of view, we've seen the safe ways to use this herb. What about from a traditional Chinese medical point of view? Is it a very balanced herb? Does it tend to push our body in one direction or another? Does it need to be offset with other herbs in a formula? It definitely isn't a balanced herb. Mr. Quackerdoodle was using it as his single herb because he was a hillbilly who lived in a hut. Over time, over the next two, three thousand years, whatever, uh, it became understood that you want to combine it with other herbs to ameliorate any potential side effects or to keep it from going too far in one direction. In the context of a traditional formula, it's much safer than it is on its own. And this is because it's over time been tried and you know tested so that there are certain herbs that it's not mixed with and certain herbs that it is mixed with and this is why you don't want to just haphazardly be testing i mean if you do cool write it down let me know because better you the guinea pig than me but there have already been millions and even billions of guinea pigs human guinea pigs in world history the tragic mixes that they experienced it didn't go so well they often recorded or you know even culturally there became an understanding that you don't do that so by respecting the tradition you're also respecting all of the adverse reactions that have happened in human history and by kind of going with what tradition has already found and then exploring the science behind that you get a nice starting point and then it's a, a much more responsible way to approach botanical medicine than just saying, well, I heard this herb is great and I heard this other herb is great. If I combine them, this is definitely going to be amazing because sometimes it doesn't work that way. So it was MicroGuard that got us talking about this. A lot of the external releasing herbs typically want to be used for a short term, short period of time. 
but we know that there's a lot of people using MicroGuard, you know, over a longer period of time as needed without much issues. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how that's possible? Yeah, dosage is really key. So if you're using 30 grams of Biger, then you're going to want to use that for a very short duration of time. The particular herb mix that is combined with Biger and this formula make it very safe for long-term use. In this case, Biger is being used as a guide herb to help open up the glymphatic system so that everything can get cleared out. I had to look at what were some of the main challenges facing North Americans, modern people in general, and then explore, okay, the gut-brain axis is off. As a result, the glymphatic system is shutting down, people are getting neural decay. So there are herbs in there like Shu Chang Pu and the MicroGuard Plus, which are working via the gut-brain axis to stimulate neurogenesis, but who cares? If your brain and your cerebral spinal fluid have become like an old fish tank, it doesn't matter what's in there to help regenerate nerve tissue. Everything is going to be eaten apart. So getting that lymphatic flush, that glymphatic flush, is essential if you want quality sleep and neural regeneration. I used to carry every herbal formula I could get my hands on. You can just imagine how this clogged up shelf space and mental space. Plus, it gave me a lot to dust every week. We looked at our most effective products, our automatic top sellers, and found that they coincided with the most popular and effective herbal products in East Asia. We decided to focus on the winners and then make them even better. Our research team in Chengdu upgraded these formulas using the highest quality herbs on the planet and rigorously testing them at pharmaceutical standard for quality and safety. You'll want to get your hands on this, and you'll get your supplies at botanicalbiohacking.com. Thanks for listening to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Miles.